Marketer Cheve. She is the author of Crossing the Thinnest Line. Lauren, thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad to be here. This is such a timely conversation to be nothing having. Nothing to talk about. <laughs> yeah, nothing to talk about, truly. Um, I'm excited to have you today. It's, uh, it's, you've done a lot of work. I would say out of all the books and people I've interviewed, you've put probably the most research into what you're doing, um, which is saying a lot, I think. Uh, you've really, really put a lot of thought into this. Um, can you tell me how you got started on this journey? You talk about that in your book. Yeah. Uh, but let's, let's just talk about you for a minute, and then we can kind of talk about the book. Sure. So, you know, the book is, a, at its core, the book is really about how we, as one of the most diverse nations on Earth, find a way to ensuring that that diversity becomes the source of strength and prosperity and sort of um, personal growth for all Americans that it really can and should be. Um, but I comment the subject, this topic of diversity, from my own life, and I talk a lot about that in the book because I feel really blessed in many ways that I grew up in Washington, D.C., which in my childhood was you know, one of the most diverse places in America. It was over 90% African American and you know, people from all over the world because of the embassies. It remains a very diverse city. But that experience of um, really coming to live with and know and be challenged by what happens when you live in a place full of people that are very different from you um, I really feel created some of the most enriching personal experiences of my life. And it has set me on a lifelong journey to try to make things better in this country, to help Americans wrap their arms around how complicated and difficult it is to live and work and uh, work together in, when we come from so many different corners of the world and so many different kinds of backgrounds. And, and I really deeply believe that that ability of Americans to be more deeply empathetic of one another and to be making the effort to understand each other is, is one of the most pressing issues of our time. And so I wrote the book because when I looked around at what was happening in the country, it just seemed that we hadn't really been having a very sophisticated, I mean, this is maybe the understatement of the century, but that we weren't having a sophisticated enough conversation about the complexity of who we are as a nation. And um, so much of it was getting boiled down to, you know, a couple tweets and a hashtag. And I thought, you know, it's time to have a more thoughtful dialogue about sort of the economics and what's at stake. And then on a really human level, mm -hmm. how we can all contribute to making a more inclusive, more peaceful, more understanding nation. Definitely. And one thing that I noticed in your book is that you managed to Talk about uh, like so many facets of society where there needs to be, uh, you know, that line needs to be crossed or bridged between, um, you talk about uh, gender, you talk about race, you talk about uh, socioeconomic status, you talk about uh, generation, generation. Yeah. you like cover it all. And it's really, truly remarkable that you were able to do that in you know, so many pages. And I felt like I didn't get it. I mean, I felt like I actually didn't get it to include everyone in the way that I wanted to. I mean, I, you know, I didn't get to talk, for instance, about, I'll, I'll talk a lot about Americans with disabilities, for instance. And so, you know, that was an area that I felt like I just had to kind of pick where I was going to focus. But look, I mean, I view so many of the issues that we're facing as a nation as interconnected, right? I mean, the, right now, I, mean, I think, you know, you can really, this current moment, right, we're, we're in the middle of, of thinking through and dealing with the fallout from the Me Too moment, right? And I, I do a lot of work on women's issues. I run a women's leadership organization. I spend a huge amount of time working on the topic of sexual harassment and women's equality in the workplace. We are facing the deadline on DACA. Um, we have unprecedented numbers of, deep Ameri of, of Americans, truly Americans, who are getting deported because they lack documentation or because ICE has become you know, deadly serious in their enforcement in ways that I think most Americans would find really appalling. Uh, we have you know, ongoing issues around race and cultural understanding, which you know, continue. I mean, I'd like to think that in a way you could feel like this week somehow they really exploded because of the president's comments. But the fact is we've been, they've exploded over and over and over and over again, mm -hmm. you know, throughout the last, you know, through, since the history of the founding of the nation. And so, you know, I really think a lot about how do we get to a better place as a country? Yeah. You know, how do we create a more empathetic and understanding nation? How do we make sure 
that the kinds of you know, bigotry and xenophobia that is coming from our president, and I say that with you know, a heavy heart, but that's coming from our president, you know, ends with him in that we, and that it is really, it becomes a relic of the past of older generations and that we ensure that the you know, progress that I think is so, um, so there, particularly among Gen Ys, that we sustain that. And there are a lot of systemic issues that are connected to our ability to be an inclusive nation. There are choices that we have to make in terms of policy, in terms of where we live, in terms of how we vote, in terms of you know, how we spend our time and who we engage with. And so in the book, I really try to paint a picture of, of not just like how difficult the situation is, because it is, but also of all the promise and possibility that's out there and, and some of the choices that we can make that would really make things better. What do you have to say to people, um, for instance, so I'm from Texas and I grew up in like a rel relatively, like pretty much in a bubble. Um, and you, you mentioned that you did for a little bit as well. And then I went to a school that was, um, you know, I always like took a bus there and mm -hmm. it really opened my world, but it was in the worst part of town and it was, mm -hmm. you know, it was a magnet school that was, um, yeah. you know, anyway, I loved it. But uh. what do you say to people? So I go back now to Texas yeah. and, yeah. um, you know, there are people there, like educated people who don't see, uh, that there's a race problem. They don't see like racism and they definitely don't see a uh, gender issue yeah. either. What do you say to right. that? You know, and like, how do you talk about that right. with like, cause it's there, it's like, it it's very much, that's a thought that they, that's where they are. So there's a lot in your question. And yeah. I think, I think there's a couple of pieces of it and I want to, I want to break down some of them. So I think you touched on a bunch of really important topics. A lot of which I talk about in the book. Yeah. The United States is still a profound, has still a profoundly segregated education system. You know, in 1954, when the Supreme Court ruled in the landmark case, of course, Brown versus Board of Education, that separate education was inherently unequal. You know, all over the country, you know, it, it's it's hard, it's easy to forget the extraordinary resistance that many states, and it's not just the southern states. I mean, even in states like New York and in Missouri and around the country, that states resisted. Um, school integration for a very long time. I talk about in the book that St. Louis, the St. Louis School District, didn't even begin to comply with Brown versus Board of Education until 1984. Oh my God, that and makes me sick. It's crazy, well in yeah. New York City, so here we are, you know, liberal New York City, let's not forget, New York City is the third most segregated school district in America. And when you look at the chart of school integration, I often put this up, there's a chart of, of school, the progress of school integration in the country since 1954, and it is a bell curve. And it essentially peaked in the 90s. So, so what that means is that you probably benefited from the peak yeah. of efforts around school integration. But the progress has now reversed and declined because there have been lawsuits in a number of places against um, city and state efforts to integrate schools. Now, when we talk about school integration, we have historically talked about the the negative impact that school segregation has had largely on minority kids because it is true that the minority children wind up often because the way tax maps are drawn and it reinforces poverty, but that the minority kids disproportionately suffer. But what we've not talked about is the extraordinary benefit that white kids get totally. from going to diverse schools. And there's actually evidence that psychologically and intellectually that all children, including the white kids, including the majority kids, benefit intellectually from being in diverse schools. So when our school systems continue to double down on the historic sort of injustice of school segregation, not only are they doing a disservice to the minority kids who always wind up in the worst schools, but ultimately they're still doing a disservice to the white kids too. Yeah. Because those kids, as you said, like don't get the kind of exposure to difference that actually expands their capacity to learn and to understand the world around them. So I think school integration continues to be one of the most important yeah. issues. Even of the time. ones that are integrated, like the magnet program that I was in, it was still like the magnet program was mainly all I mean, not really, probably like sixty yeah. percent white kids and then like the rest were the people who were not in the magnet program. You no, know, these issues are very complicated, and they continue to get reinforced. And so, so, so we talk. So we talk about that. And I, I deeply believe that every city and municipality in America needs to get back to working on school uh, desegregation, and it is a massive issue that that has to be tackled, and everybody has to play a part in fixing that. 
On the other hand, I also think that is tied to this other point that you mentioned, which is Americans, particularly white Americans, or the divide between Americans who see issues of race and those who do not, right? And I think, you know, part of why I felt actually, you know, as a white woman writing a book about diversity, right? You know, I always say I'm, I'm not hard. Tarnassi. I can't imagine. Have you received flack from that? Um, a little bit, but I, I think that there is this sort of appreciation that, like, and I, and that was certainly my intention that, like, if white people aren't talking about this, those, you know, as the majority, you know, it cannot always be minority Americans fighting this fight. Like, we need white Americans to see these issues and to take them seriously and to advocate for them because we are in the majority. Yeah. And we do hold pa disproportionate power. I mean, the same thing is true on gender issues, right? We need white men yeah. advocating on behalf of women. It cannot always just be women doing that nice say white men because they are in fact the majority. But look, the issue in the country, and you saw this, I always tell this story because you saw this in the vice presidential debate, which now seems like a thousand years ago. There was this crazy exchange between I wish it was. Pence, I know, right? Yeah, we'd be between able to be president by I know, now. I know. Between, you know, Pence and, and Kane, and the argument was about is there bias in policing, right? Yeah. And they fundamentally disagree on this. And there are a lot of Americans who are deeply invested in the belief that racism does not exist. Yeah, they and truly they do not really don't understand it. it. And a lot of them, they read about it in textbooks. They're like, it's over. And it's then over. they don't really look don't around. It. Yeah, just right. like truly it doesn't, they don't so see it. My view is that, look, I think there are plenty of Americans who've never had an experience. I mean, I think when you push the buttons and you ask people, you know, to identify a moment in their life where they felt like an outsider, yeah. you know, they can empathize with that. But I think we've, we've framed this whole thing wrong. Like, you know, you may never get somebody to, to intuitively believe that there's racism or to be able to identify with that experience, right? I mean, for someone with privilege, they just can't even wrap their head around it. It's like society is actively not working for a huge part of the country. Well, so that's the key, is, is my view, is that if we can get Americans to acknowledge that whether or not you believe it to be true, yeah. that if anyone in this country believes that they do not have the full access yeah. to the American dream, we should want to fix that. Totally. Whether or not you believe it to be true, it should be enough that people feel that they don't have, that they don't live in a meritocracy. Yeah. The essence of who we are meant to be as a nation is meritocratic. And so if we have millions of Americans and all the data shows that we've got millions and millions of Americans yeah. you know, who don't see this country as a meritocracy, we should want to make that better. Really interesting data though, is that the, the Americans most likely to, to identify with the kinds of bias that, for instance, minorities uh, you know, will identify. So in other words, white Americans most likely to believe and identify with those issues are Gen Y, the younger Americans, those hmm. same kids that benefited from school integration, yeah. that went to the most integrated time in American schooling, those are the same kids yeah. that actually see and identify with the challenges that minority Americans are talking about. That's great. And so this stuff matters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my God, we could talk about like so talk, about talk about it uh, for so long. I do have some questions uh, coming in, and I have a ton sure. of questions here. I'm going to continue to get to just a few of mine because um, I had the privilege of reading the book. And then uh, for those of you watching us, put your questions in the comments, and we will make sure to get them to Lauren yes. uh, while I'll this is them live. All when I can. Yeah, but yeah, or afterwards or after, as well. Yeah. So um, type those in there, and then uh, we will get those to Lauren. And then uh, I'm going to continue with just a few that I have um, here. So, um, I mean, there's, like, so much to... Well, look, I mean, this week alone, I mean, you take any week in the news cycle. I mean, we're dealing with the DACA conversation, yeah. you know, which, again, is just so... Um, it's heartbreaking in a way where the conversation is gone because, again, it's just this, like, lack of empathy yeah. and understanding for the experience of, of what are really fellow Americans. And, again, like, you see massive generational divides along, along these lines. You know, when I do media and I... I nothing elicits more vitriol uh, on social media than when I talk about... Uh, when I talk about the undocumented or to talk about, uh, you know, about immigration. And, you know, the data, just most of what you hear on the news about this, unfortunately, mostly from conservatives, is just dead wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the net contribution of undocumented Americans to the economy oh my God. far exceeds, by billions and billions of dollars, far exceeds what they have taken. The vast majority of immigrants to the country today are educated. The vast majority of immigrants who come, even through you know family visas, 
you know, wind up working and contributing to American society. And we have a labor shortage in the country right now, which is why we have big businesses, you know, dozens and dozens of corporations petitioning the government to figure this out because we can't afford not to have this segment of the labor force. It is not a diminishing pie. Our economy is not a zero sum game. Yeah. The more contributors we have to it, the bigger the pie gets for everyone. Yeah. And that entire argument, the economic piece of it, and even just the like human compassion piece of this has been completely erased in the recent months. And I think it's such a such a shame. And you know, we were talking about this before. It is not just about Republicans and Democrats. You know, George W. Bush won thirty percent of the Hispanic vote, in part because he was pushing really hard for immigration reform and he felt compassionate towards those who want to make a better life for their families. It was part of his Christian values. It was yeah. part of his Texan experience, right? He spoke Spanish. He understood. He had empathy, yeah. deep and sincere empathy for the experience of those who want to make America their home. And I believe that a lot of that is actually in the Republican principles around immigration. But so much of that has been hijacked by the basest, most dead wrong you know, misinformation and frankly lies yeah. about um, about the the truth about what immigration is for our country, and and it's heartbreaking. It is that that actually uh, goes to one of my questions, uh, which is you you spoke about um, you said what is happening, or you said at the heart of the conflict are fundamental values and identity as a nation. And I think uh, that stood out to me because the, I think the problem that we're facing is that those fundamental values and identity that we have as a nation is different depending on who you're speaking right. to. So how can we go about deciding what our values are? are is well, it what so the Constitution is based of the, off of? Or? Well, look, all of the polls actually show that there's remarkable unity among Americans in terms of some of our core values, right? The idea of meritocracy. You know, the idea of inclusiveness, of welcoming people from around the world, the sense that uh, freedom and liberty is at the core of who we are, that self-expression, creativity, uh, openness are all part of the Mer American identity that the vast majority of Americans actually agree on. But what has happened because of social media, because of, frankly, our president, uh, we have radically amplified what is actually not representative of who we are. And our political system has also amplified that. And I talk a lot about that in the book because I deeply believe that at the heart of this is also an issue of representation in our government. And I spend a lot of my time working on getting more women into political office and into the political process. I think that's going to be essential for underrepresented groups as well. The political system has empowered people who are not representative. And you see this in the gerrymandering in the states. You see this in the Electoral College. You see this in you know, almost every dimension of our political process. It is not who we are. Mm -hmm. And we have got to, and I think this is a huge, I think this is going to be a huge opportunity for Gen Y, right? 92 million Americans are in Gen Y, the most educated generation in history, the most open-minded and inclusive generation in history who fundamentally believe in the right, equal rights for gays and lesbians, who you know, cannot imagine why we don't have equality for women, who see this nation as a nation of immigrants, who want dreamers to have every opportunity. I mean, all the attitudes that you see in Gen Y are what I believe are core American values. But the question is, will Gen Y opt out because they're frustrated by what they see, or will they push to really ensure the nation represents who they are? Yeah. And they are in the majority. Yeah, 92 yeah. million Americans, the largest generation in American history. Their values have got to be represented. Your values. I'm, I'm too old. I'm X. <laughs> uh, I'm the sandwich generation. But we, we've got to insist that our values be represented. Yeah, it's really... And that's not about political party. And I'll tell you, I have a lot of friends who are working very hard inside the Republican Party, for instance, to push for, uh, you know, for a, pla a Republican platform that is inclusive of gays, of gays and lesbians. Mm. And there's actually a lot happening behind the scenes that you don't hear about in the news. Very active, very powerful Republicans who are pushing very hard to get their party to stop uh, you know, excluding and treating uh, gay and lesbian Americans as, as, as less than equal. And, and I think that is going to continue to change history is on their side. Yeah, it's really funny. I hear so, so often, I'm socially liberal, but I'm uh, fiscally Republican. Mm -hmm. And you're like, OK, well, there's not a party for that right now. <laughs> well, and it's very painful for those people. I think it's very painful for conservatives who don't see, you know, who don't see their values yeah. reflected in what is the current public discourse. And it's not representative. And look, I got to talk about one other line, right? yeah. which we don't talk about a lot, 
which is right now one of the deepest lines in the country, and that is between political party. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I, as a lifelong liberal, consider it the I believe it is the height of hypocrisy when my liberal friends vilify every Republican in America. Yeah. They, they, we paint all Republicans as Donald Trump Republicans. I know. We say they're all bigots. That it, liberals are guilty of this. And so as inclusive as we say we are, we're inclusive as long of as it's with people who Republican. agree with us. Yeah. And, and I think that's I a real problem. Yeah, it is. Like, we have got to start living. And, and look, everyone's guilty of this, right? We have become so polarized politically. And it is, it is not how it has to be. Yeah. You know, there is a lot of gray. And most Americans, and, and all the data supports this, most Americans are not dogmatic on one side or the other. Yeah. You know, you've got people in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin who voted for Obama and then turned around and voted for, for Donald Trump. Yeah. We need to understand that better. Yeah. As hard as it is, as painful as it can be to confront, you know, to, in, to connect with people who we see as having vastly different values, if we don't learn how to do that, we are doomed mm -hmm. to this perpetually polarized nation. I don't want to live that way. That's not the country that I want to live in. Yeah. Me either. Um, Get all fired up. Oh, I know. I do too. Uh, I love it so much. I mean, it's just, we have s so much to talk about. Your book really strikes a chord with so many, like, big topics. Um, you know, one of them that you spoke about, and there's a few things that I just want to get to, but sure. we do have uh, questions coming okay. in. So, um, you know, there's there's things that aren't, like, so, like, black and white so to speak like the the race there you know the race race racism and then uh, gender discrimination to me those are just like okay that's happening it's a no-brainer um on gender discrimination you mentioned something that Sheryl Sandberg said when she had at the Milken Global Conference yeah. that I found really interesting uh where she was saying how do we get more women into the workforce yeah what do you what what are we what yeah. are we doing for that? Well first so let me level set for a second. So for the last forty years, really since sort of the height of the women's movement, which was, you know, in the early, in mid seventies when I was born, there has been this sort of steady line up of women entering the workforce, right? Now, minority Amer minority women have always been in the workforce. But particularly the entrant of like white and middle class women into the workforce, you know, has been a dramatic change. And and part of that is because of educational opportunities that open and the workforce has opened and, and things have radically changed, right? You know, from one generation to the next. And so we have had this like steady lineup. But in the last few years, for the first time in our lifetimes, the labor force participation of women, the number of women just working, mm -hmm. has begun to decline. Now that's a problem, and, and what a lot of the economists say is that if we were to just close that gap, if we were just to make sure that equal numbers of men and women were working, it would add $5 trillion to the American economy. That's 5% that's GDP. That's right. massive growth. So all around the world, lots of countries have looked at this data and said, we need to invest in doing everything we can to make it easy for women to stay in the workforce. By the way, this isn't even talking about the, the wage gap, which yeah. is a whole other piece of this. Just keeping women working, right? Women who want to work, women who need to work, we need to make it easier for them. Now, the United States has not made any of the investments that other countries, like, for instance, the Nordic countries that have the most gender equality of anywhere in the world, or Iceland, those are countries that have invested in what? State-subsidized uh, state childcare, paid family leave, not just maternity leave, but family leave, uh, all kinds of workplace supports for women to make it possible for them to work and to stay in the workforce, but for working families to have the infrastructure that they need to stay working. Now, in the United States, for many Americans, the calculation, the cost of childcare is so high, it doesn't pay to go to work, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so you wind up with, we all understand this certainly in cities like New York where, you know, but everywhere the cost is out of control. So it is back to the same issue though, which is that when you look at the countries that have the most gender equality in the workplace, Guess what those countries also have? Yeah. The most gender equality politically. <laughs> because it takes getting women into office to, unfortunately, because I think men are not appreciating the, the importance of these issues. But when women get into elected office, they change this stuff. They invest in these things. The United States is 73rd in the world for the political participation and empowerment of women. And by the way, that's dropped 20 places since I wrote the book no. a year ago. <laughs> no. So, you know, these things are tied together. And I think 
you know, most American women have not appreciated, you know, especially younger women like us, you know, we feel like we've had so many opportunities. And part of what the Me Too moment is done is like blown the walls off of all of our illusions about how equal we are. Yeah. And that equality is about, you know, how we're treated. It's also about the opportunities, but it's also about some of the structural stuff yeah. that just makes it harder for women to work. Totally. And poor women, 70% of Americans in poverty are women and children. Yeah. 70%. I, it. I can't imagine having to climb out. No, it's only, unimaginable. Like just alone, but with a child as well. Yeah. Um, so we have some questions. Oh, good. Uh, I hear them. And if I can, I'll get to my other ones, okay. but I probably won't. Good. <laughs> I'm curious what people are um, asking. So Laura Blaze says, what are some encouraging aspects of our present time that make you feel optimistic going forward? You know what? I'm so glad you asked that because I actually have a lot of them. I actually really do. I'm actually incredibly optimistic. So, so a couple things that I'm optimistic about. I think the leadership and commitment to diversity that is coming out of the Fortune 500 is astonishing. Mm -hmm. right? It's not just Sheryl Sandberg and Lean In. It's every CEO of virtually every major public company that is committed to greater gender equity and to racial diversity in their businesses and is getting deadly serious about it. That's a radical change. That was not the case 10 years ago. And I think some of the most progressive, thought-provoking, uh, important work on this topic is happening in American companies. And so kudos, you know, there's still plenty of problems and Me Too has certainly highlighted that, but I think on balance for public companies, there's a lot of great stuff happening. I talked before about the generational shift. I think there's no question that Gen Y has a vastly different view of these issues than certainly the boomers do. And I think it, the Gen Xers like me are somewhere in the middle. And certainly we, don't even, we haven't even gotten to get our arms around what Gen, how Gen Z sees this stuff. And so I do think that like this sort of basic expectation of equality that has come through being you know, digitally open and all the connection points that Gen Y makes is so important and powerful. And I'm really excited about that. And then the last thing is that I think that the 2016 election has been a massive awakening for a lot of people in this country who didn't think we needed to be involved in our political process, who didn't think it mattered whether or not we participated in our democracy. And I think, you know, the silver lining of this, you know, really challenging time is the millions and millions of Americans, many women particularly, for the first time are realizing that participation in our democracy matters and actually impacts our lives. And so I think that is an incredibly good thing. I want to see that participation last, though, no matter who's in the White House. That it not just be about angry at any one person, that it be about our responsibility as Americans, our collective responsibility to build the nation that we want. Um, and, and I think that's we're heading in the right direction there. Totally. Uh, Chris says, how does, segrega how does segregation manifest in public schools today? And also, what can teachers do in the classroom to mm. prevent this? Yeah, well, so the reason why there's still such a high level of school segregation is because most school districts are still drawn around tax maps, which means that school districts are drawn around where people live. And all over America, there are neighborhoods in almost every city and county that were actually intentionally created to exclude certain racial and ethnic groups. In fact, that was legal. So Long Island's a great example of that. You know, Long Island had discriminatory housing, uh, housing practices where blacks and Hispanics and other minorities, even Jews, were not allowed to live in certain neighborhoods. And the legacy of that is that all over America, even though that's now illegal and the, you know, you can't, you can't, housing discrimination gets pretty intensely enforced, the legacy of it is that there's still, you know, millions of neighborhoods that are totally segregated. Yep. And then if you draw the school districts around those neighborhoods, which is historically how we do it, you reinforce that segregation. And there's lots and lots of, I have lots of examples of that in the book. So we need to rethink the way school districts are drawn. Um, that is fundamental. And there are a lot of mayors. I just talked to the mayor of Minneapolis who's working on this. I know Mayor de Blasio here in New York has been working on this. And we have to support those political leaders when they do it. When they try to change those tax maps and rezone re the schools, I'm going to tell you, mostly white families go crazy. Mm -hmm. It's not in my backyard. It's do it for some other school district. We have to be willing. Yeah. We have to be willing to do that. And I know it's complicated and I know it's loaded and everybody's worried about how their kids are going to do. But we have to be able to support those things. So, so that is really like a huge part of it. And unfortunately, I don't think teachers have as much power in this as I wish they did. Obviously, I, want, I think teachers should encourage kids 
uh, to really get to know each other in deep ways and to explore different cultures as part of their curriculum, and that's so important. I mean, I remember being asked, you know, learning to say good morning in a different language every day in kindergarten, and that had an effect on me. But there are big systemic issues at play that we need our school boards and our mayors and our governors taking very seriously. Great. Uh, Jeff says, regarding Me Too, do you feel it's finally found the line of going too far with what has been the response to Aziz Ansari's Me Too movement? Yeah, I knew this would come up. So I have a hard time with the Aziz Ansari story, and I'll just tell you that I've been out talking about Me Too you know, all over the country on every network. And I, I also run a women's leadership program with Gretchen Carlson. Oh, who, she's amazing. She's amazing, who of course really started this in many ways when she sued Roger Ailes at Fox News for sex discrimination two years ago and like blew the walls off of this topic. And she and I work very closely together. We're bringing training to victims of harassment and violence all over the country. We're just in Minneapolis and Dallas. So I'm very close to this issue. I also talk with a lot of Fortune 500 companies around how they're dealing with it and how they're enforcing conduct and culture standards in their businesses. But, um, and I do believe that the victims deserve you know, every right, and I think the vast majority of women who step forward do so uh, reluctantly uh, and have nothing to gain personally from doing it. They take a much bigger risk than anything else. And also, I ha feel a sense of obligation to men who um, are not mind readers and who um, cannot be expected to read minds. And I, that what worries me about the Aziz Ansari story is just how gray it is. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been, Emma Gray at Huffington Post yesterday wrote a very thoughtful piece about the complexities of how women deal with their sexuality and their discomfort with boundaries in some instances. And I think all of that is worthy conversation, but I worry very much about an effect where we're, we have some very public naming and shaming of people that may be unfair and that then leads to a lot of discounting of real, a very serious uh, assault. And I think it's very easy to gray lines which actually are quite black and white. Yeah. And I see a lot of men struggling with that. So there's no easy answer here. I, I, I thought it was unfortunate that he got called out publicly um, in this particular instance. Is it perfect? No. Is he perfect? No. But there's a world of difference between, you know, Matt Lauer and Harvey Weinstein yeah. and what happened on a date for Aziz Ansari. And, and that, that I find painful Yeah. because Americans don't do well with gray. I mean, we just don't. We, 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 uh, and this issue, we really need to stick. I, there's a lot of value in having the deeper conversations about gender roles, but we really need to help people be really clear. You got to walk before you can run. We need people to understand the very bright red lines yeah. before we start. I mean, it's imp it's an imperfect world, but you know that that's my concern about that issue. Um, on that, actually, we have um, let's see. Uh, John says, should women continue to work within a masculine framework or try to create their own agenda? Well, I, I mean, I think it's kind of both. I mean, the reality is, is that it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg, right? Until women reach critical mass, and you know, there's sort of widely understood appreciation that there's something like around 30% is kind of the magic number that until women have at least 30% or more of the leadership roles in an organization, you know, they, they, ha they lack the sufficient influence and power to really change corporate culture. So there's a bit of a chicken in the egg. Can you get to 30% if the culture excludes them? So, you know, I, look, I deeply believe that women have the possibility to be changing things as they go, meaning you can, I believe, be more successful than you could in the past, even being your authentic self and not necessarily adapting to try to be something you're not. But there are also a lot of environments, and you know, banking is a great example of that, where the behavior that gets rewarded is very stereotypically male, macho behavior. And look, as a country, we still think that's what a leader is. Yeah. I mean, part of why we elected Donald Trump is because, and why so many people saw Obama as a weak leader is because fundamentally we still think leadership is command and control, macho, hierarchical leadership. Yeah. And I, I deeply believe that to be true. It's, it's subconscious and it's conscious. That is what and we think a leader looks. It's, it's like, so ingrained. It's Women in all the think books that. from Men the time you're little. Of course. Like, of course. That all is the what hero we think. stories. Of like, course. That's what we think a leader looks like. There's tremendous 
sort of subconscious and conscious stuff there. So look, I think that I don't believe that it's up to women exclusively to change this stuff. I think men need to take a leadership role. And I talk a lot, a lot, a lot in the book about the power that men have to change corporate culture, to make it possible for you know, different kinds of people. And it's not just women, it's just anyone that's not in that mold uh, to be successful. So, you know, I, I think it's both, but the more that women push against those barriers, you know, I do believe it changes. And I, it shouldn't just be up to us, but until, anyone, until everyone else is helping, it's gonna be. Yeah. All right, we have one last comment and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, who are some of the writers covering this topic that inspire you? Um, you know, I do love the work that Charles Blow and ta Coates Coates are doing on, on race issues. I think it's both of them, although they've had some, well, there have been some, you know, debates, but I think they're both doing extraordinary work in that space. And I think there are, you know, increasingly, um, you know, sort of getting the attention that they deserve. And then, you know, I do think Rebecca Traster and uh, Jessica Valenti at the New York Times are really important voices. I love what Emma Gray is doing at, at Huffington Post. There's so many. Uh, you know, the uh, Teen Vogue has become, emerged as, you know, under Elaine, Teen Vogue has become like one of the most important progressive voices of our time. There's so much out there and um, just so much to digest. And, and I think it's, it's very exciting that, look, when I did this book, I'll just tell you, like, it was hard to get this published. I was very lucky that a major publisher picked it up. People don't think this stuff matters. Yeah. And so finally, I think there are more voices out there asking hard questions. Um, you know, but we all have to be in this dialogue, and I think that's what's sort of extraordinary about this time is the democratization of these conversations, which, you know, is really important. We all have something to say, um, yeah. and we should all be listening to each other. And my question is, uh, my last question for you is, who did you write this book for? That's a great question. I mean, you know, in many ways for my daughters, and, and I didn't talk about this on the air, but my, my girls are African American, and, uh, you know, I feel a certain sense of obligation to, um, to understand the issues better so that I can be a better parent to them as a white mother. Um, but look, it's for everyone. Like, I, I just, I can't, I love this country and I love what the potential of this country is. And I deeply believe that we have extraordinary, an extraordinary potential um, to be inclusive and welcoming and transformational and a leader for the world. And I, I fear that we've somewhat lost our way, but I believe in our ability to find the way back. And I believe in the fundamental goodness of Americans and the fundamental belief that we are stronger because of the diversity of who we are. And, um, and so I really, for me, I wrote it from the heart, um, but also for all Americans who believe that we're stronger together. And you also did a ton of research. And um, yeah, thanks. It's, it's, it's so informative. And mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you put pen to paper and Me got too. it out there. Me too. Um, Lauren, thank you so much. Where can our audience find more about you and follow you, et cetera? Yeah, you can go to laurenleadershive.com. Um, my organization is all in together if you want to learn more about the political work that I'm doing. And the book is available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and everywhere. Uh, that books are sold online and in the bookstores and everywhere else. But um, I'd love to hear more from your viewers. And so as people read it and want to engage, please reach out through my website. I'd love to hear from you and hear what you thought. Perfect. All right, cool. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much. Do you have any parting words? Um, I, re I, I, believe, I believe in the power and possibility and potential of, of great intention. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you guys.